Chapter Fifteen of From Mud to Mufti by Bruce Barron's Father. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fifteen: Diversions in Amiens, Hotel du Rhin, An Extended Inspection Tour, Birthplace of Old Bill. For many, many weeks this job went on, full of a variety of small incidents, good, bad, and indifferent. I got to know my work and continued to persevere with life in that peculiar resigned but optimistically determined fashion which is common to all the component parts of the Allied armies in the field. I liked the job. I liked those I lived with and those I met. Now and again we went into Amiens, and this was always a great event for us. Something like market day to a farmer, who lives a crowded rural life ten miles from a station, and drives a consumptive horse in once a week to the nearest apology for a town. Whenever the colonel had to visit a railhead near Amiens, he went there either before or after his inspection. And you can bet I was always on for being in that expedition. I am glad I saw Amiens in those days, because I saw it afterwards, and I can feel for the inhabitants in that terrible trial which befell the city during the last big dying flicker of the Prussian push. Amiens was about fifteen miles from our headquarters, but it was well worth the trouble of getting there. Montrelet was very nice and picturesque, and all that, but I confess I like a bit of crowded humanity and sparkle now and again. Not that one got much in Amiens, but still it was better than nothing. We used to go there after a devastating and dry visit to long -O, or Haley, or some miserable oasis nearby. The great thing was to lunch somewhere. If anybody ever reads this book he is almost sure to have a gladiator relation or friend who has been to Amiens, and has had lunch at one of the restaurants, or at the Hotel du Rhin. All my pals seem to have drifted into the Hotel du Rhin. In fact, if I come across an old sport who knows the front, I succinctly murmur something about the Hotel du Rhin and it at once conveys visions to his feverish mind of the gladdest nights that were then permissible. How many, many of those wonderful, courageous chaps have wandered into Amiens, and had what was to them the best of fun, a lunch in Amiens, and then gone back to their squadron, battalion, or platoon, never to return. The buccaneering romance of this is enormous, and sad. Well, anyway, we used to go to Amiens, and in a crowded, frowsy restaurant down one of the main streets we would lunch and revel in the joys of fried fish, mysterious meat, and red wine. It was a dear old town, and to see the cathedral with a pyramid of sandbags at the front door makes one very annoyed at these perpendicular-haired gentlemen who have elected to disturb the world so violently. And so the weeks went on. Work and travel, evenings full of war gossip and rumors of great events to come, now and again punctuated by these visits to Amiens. I went on with it all but slowly and bit by bit. The whole environment was reducing me to a very low ebb. Those who read may wonder why, and possibly those who read may never understand. But to me the sum total of the idea and real horrible reality of this terrible elementary and brutal war was burning a hole into my mind and system which time can never heal. Somehow, when I sat in that dreadful death-charged mud, I felt it less. But here, outside and behind it, I got a clear perspective of the frightfulness of the thing. It's not the actual danger or the death and sorrow. It's the idea of this drastic antagonism of humanity separated by merely national aims. But why should I bore or wound people with these thoughts of mine? I will return to the real great and inspiring idea of war. Bright uniforms, heroic victories, medals and cheering multitudes. I write these lines as our mighty and wonderful nation, with the assistance of others, has just reached the glorious and hard-fought conclusion which was vitally necessary. I have only digressed for a few moments in order not to forget the amazing wonder of those simple, valorous souls who, as component parts, did things the greatness of which few realize and none can grasp. Things which, in their country and home-loving way, although submerged owing to their smallness, are mightier than the war itself. 
There came a time at Montrelet when it became necessary for the colonel to wander further afield. There was a tendency for journeys to be taken north of Doulon. I welcomed this, and was still further elated when one morning he announced he had to go right up north. To Ypres, in fact. This was splendid. I was more than keen to see once more the old stomping ground. Armentieres, Baloil, Locre, and Ypres. They were all places with a big fascination for me. The day came when we started. The colonel, the driver, and myself slid off in a large car, and soon were rolling along the winding, dusty road from Montrelet. It's a great game being able to go about the front in a car. You can loll back amongst the upholstery and calmly survey the ruins as they flash past you, now and again having the satisfaction of being accidentally mistaken for a general, as some dust-covered pedestrian catches sight of you as you flit past. When one really has acquired that limousine loll, it's a great sensation. Beats sitting in a frozen dugout with stand two at four a.m. beats it hollow. We went through a vast mass of dull blackened country and wound our way over the cobbled streets of innumerable small towns and villages, now and again stopping to try and reconcile an unintelligible signpost with the road on our map, or listening to the still more unintelligible explanations and directions of some Frenchman, from whom in a weak moment we had asked the way. Anyway, on we went, and bit by bit, approached that mystic and romantic area known as the Ypres Armentieres sector. As I began to recognize the once familiar landmarks, the whole of the old-time war atmosphere came back with clear vigor. Here were the roads I knew so well, the broken houses, shelled-out woods, etc. Here was the land of bullets and billets, that weird country which holds in its keeping a certain dank and mysterious horror, Plug Street Wood the birthplace of old bill end of section 15 recording by philip gould chapter 16 of from mud to mufti by bruce Bairn's father this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 16 the old fighting grounds something wrong hospital in balool homesickness we arrived at balool in those days it was still a respectable and reasonable town. In fact, it was much the same as when I had been there before. A few more restaurants and officers' clubs had sprung up, but that was all. It had not been much shelled. Of course, it occasionally had to go through an air raid or something of that sort, but on the whole it was still quite a presentable spot. We didn't stop, but went straight on to the colonel's destination, which was Lacra. It was here that a certain division had its headquarters, and it was here that the colonel had someone he particularly wanted to see. Lacra is a nasty spot, becoming nastier still towards the end of the war. But at this period, and even before, it was charged with a most unpleasing atmosphere. Air raids and back area shelling were its specialties. I remember disliking this spot intensely when I spent the night with my machine gun section in its unwholesome surroundings on the night before the Second Battle of Ypres. But now I found myself disliking it still more. The place looked horribly mutilated and dismal. The colonel went to a headquarters. I waited outside. As he was going to be some time, I went to have a look at the various parts of the place I knew. I went to the large church there and entered. Here it was that I had billeted on that turbulent night, the 23rd of April, 1915, and had stabled my machine-gun section by means of piling up some pews and chairs around the part where the organ is fixed. It was from this place that at dawn we had all moved off to Vlamertigne, the day before that scrap in front of St. Julien. Outside the church several long rows of crosses, new ones being added daily, testified to the severity of holding that part of the line. Later on I joined the colonel, who asked me to come with him to a house where a certain staff was located. I went and there had the honor of meeting Colonel Congreve, the famous and valorous son of the equally famous general of the name. Congreve was perhaps one of the most wonderful and courageous characters in the war. With a row of decorations earned during the war, he was one of the youngest senior staff officers in the army. An unaffected courtly young man with a lion's courage, shortly after this he was killed on the Somme. While sitting in this office I noticed that I was feeling very quaint. 
This wasn't due to the office, for I had suspected whilst coming along in the car that I was not very well. I remember feeling astonishingly bad as I left that office, and waiting by the car outside I realized I was feeling worse every moment, and a fearful pain had started at the back of my neck. Feeling for the cause of this disorder, I found a nasty sort of swelling below the hair at the back of my head. Most annoying, just when I wanted to be going strong for my visit to the salient, and, what the devil is it, I wondered to myself. However, I didn't say anything, but we all went off to see a battalion headquarters near Kimmel. My, I did feel bad and got worse every minute. I can scarcely remember that old farm we went into near the front-line trenches. I can dimly recollect a hospitable but drastically plain lunch, a crowd of officers, and seeing a lot of my cartoons torn from the papers pinned on the dilapidated walls. I don't know how I pulled through that meal. Eventually we somehow got back to Balool, and, not being able to stick the pain longer, I told the colonel that I had symptoms of an obscure and unattractive kind, and that I thought I was going to be ill. He immediately said he thought I ought to see a doctor in Balool. He was right for by the time we reached Balool I felt like a dead fly in a cream jug. They took me to a hospital, a converted convent or monastery or something, and there I waited in a collapsed heap on a form till my turn came for inspection. At last a doctor came and suspiciously examined me. Verdict? Very feverish with a carbuncle on the back of his neck. If you look up the word carbuncle in a reasonable dictionary you will see that it means a beautiful gem of a deep red color, or a painful and highly inflamed tumor. I had the latter. In fact, I had, I think, a mixture of the two, something that might be described as a gem of a highly inflamed tumor of a beautiful deep red color. I felt rotten. They gave me some medicine and said I must go to a clearing station. In other words, a field hospital. Here was a disaster. Me, ill, got to leave my job and be sent to hospital. What a blow. I knew this would mean weeks, and heaven knows what might happen after that. However, there it was, and as by now I was feeling thoroughly ill, I resigned myself to my fate. I spent that night in a bunk at the Balool Hospital. This was my second time of collapsed removal from the salient, evidently an unsuitable place for me. My first exit was after that little affair I had with a shell near St. Julien, the second this infernal carbuncle. But how unheroic this second exit! To have to leave the Ypres salient owing to a carbuncle on the back of the neck is to my mind one of the most degraded forms of heroism. There are worse places than the back of the neck to have carbuncles. I found that out most painfully later whilst languaging on the Italian Alpine front, but I will come to that in time. Next morning I was taken in an ambulance from the monastic Balool Hospital off along the dusty dreary roads down to the old sector around Doulon, and as I was carted along I dwelt with some sadness and depression on my bad fortune. Here was the end of my first staff job. I somehow felt that, once inside that hospital, I should lose all the ground I had gained and return, when repaired, to my same old life, that of a regimental captain. Visions of interminable months of trenches, billets, and ordering people to carry corrugated iron floorboards or something. Well, anyway, here I was now. Staff captain, complete with carbuncle, turning in at the gates of a beautiful chateau which at that time had just been converted into a hospital. The ambulance stopped at the front door. I got out and entered. In half an hour I was in a suit of pajamas, giant-sized, and lying on an iron bed by a window. One of the hospital doctors was coming to see me shortly. I lay and pondered. I thought of the farm at Montrelay. I thought of the colonel. What would happen now? Would I return there when I was well again or not? Outside the sun was shining in the beautiful grounds of the beautiful chateau. On the spacious lawn several nurses were walking about, those who at the moment were off duty. Several officers were out there too, convalescents and others. At the far end of the lawn, under the shade of a clump of lofty trees, a regimental band was assembling. The scene was one of delightful summer calm. What band is that? I asked. Somebody answered me through the window. The Royal Warwickshire Regiment. That was my own regiment. And as I lay there, they started up the Warwickshire March. Warwickshire is my county, and I love everything belonging to it. 
I don't know why. I was ill, perhaps. But that tune floating across that sunny, tranquil lawn made me nearly cry with an intense love and longing for England. End of chapter 16 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 17 of From Mud to Mufti by Bruce Barron's Father This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17 Evacuated to Base Monastic Seclusion Return to London Convalescence The doctor came and examined me. He did a few conjuring tricks with that half golf ball at the back of my neck and gave me things to take. I read and thought and slept and incidentally felt very ill. Time went on, and after a week I appeared to be no better. I was apparently very run down. After ten days there the doctor who watched me came and said that any idea of my going back to Montrelay was off, and that I must be evacuated to the base. That's done it, I thought, but I little knew that moment was the turning point in the whole of my war career, and that I was soon to find myself in a position which I had never dreamt of. What I took to be an unfortunate termination to my staff career was in reality the first premonitory sign of being wafted into a job which was the only one of its kind in the army. I didn't know it then, and with a depressed spirit I went off with a gang of others all correctly labeled with our various complaints down to the base. You never could say what base it was going to be or what hospital there. Those mysterious labels they tie on you may convey a wealth of meaning to the medical authorities, but nothing to yourself. After the usual form of train journey, I refer to the sixty miles with sixty hours to do it in variety, we arrived at Rouen, and were split up into several different groups and sent in ambulances to the various hospitals. I went to a fine big one on the hill above the town. This one again was a trifle ecclesiastical. It had been, I think, a sort of incubator for would-be monks. These hermits had all been roped in for service with the French army, and the building was rented at a preposterous figure by the British authorities for use as a base hospital. It was a fine hospital, too, platoons of nurses and VADs, doctors, and all the whole outfit. I was put into a room by myself. That sounds very grand, but in reality it was a sort of cubicle in a long corridor. There were open wards there as well, but a lot of us were kept in the cubicles. I imagine these box-like creations were in ordinary times used by the budding monks. They were austere enough for anything. One almost wanted to get up twice a night to scourge oneself so as to complete the picture. In this harbor of refuge they were all very good to me. The doctor said I was very run down and must rest quietly. There was really no physical reason for this. But I have had such miserable times with my state of mind and imagination about the war that it is difficult for me to explain to others what a terrible ordeal it can be. There is no reason why one should not attempt to explain this phenomenon. It is simply this. There are types of men who can go to a war such as this and see only its practical and physical side. Such a man on returning home will say, It was terrible at Ypres. Somebody will say, Why? He will then explain that the mud was something awful, and that they had to be up all night in pouring rain and never had a wink of sleep. Moreover, the ceaseless shelling necessitated them working on the trenches every day. I envy that man. I know there are others like myself to whom all that, though objectionable, is not the worst feature. It's the horrible idea of the thing the sudden reduction in the value placed on human life, the thoughts on the devastating pain and sorrow caused away back home at each casualty, the precarious conditions regarding the mode of burial, which all depend on the local conditions prevailing at the time. These thoughts, and a host of others, make such a mess of one that physical ills are nothing compared to them. In fact, to sum up, the pain and devastation to the individual are directly proportional to the amount of imagination that individual possesses. The most suitable man for a war is a butcher, the most unsuitable, a poet. And so it was that I was ill and run down. 
but thanks to an inherited juvenile spirit i can permanently camouflage a lot of troubles come up to the surface and drink in the joys of life under the soothing influences of kind-hearted nurses aided by succulent substantial assets such as chicken and occasional champagne i slowly recuperated in my cubicle and in a few days began to look back on past events and ache for pencils paints and paper i got these and dived off into a volume of scribbles sketches and jokes on a host of topics which ironically amused me if ever that monk goes back to that cubicle of his he's going to find a fine mess on the walls i perpetrated a series of most worldly drawings on the sides of his ethereal cell i added enormously to the already nauseating number of autograph albums which i have from time to time scribbled in later on i was better still and went out the medical officers very kindly invited me to their mess i disgraced their walls with further efforts and later still i reached that state of physical fitness which entitled me to go outside the grounds and roam around the town i wasn't long in taking advantage of this and daily went for a couple of hours off into rouen it's a nice old town and was very pleasing in those summer days i examined it all thoroughly i sat in cafes and amused myself as i always do with pelmanizing the place and the people i wandered around and observed the life of the place rouen had been swooped down upon by the british army and had become a large military base this of course leads to a lot of back of the front departments brass hats shone all over the place the hotel de la poste fairly glittered with them some ex-gladiators from the front others who had only heard about the front through the papers or their friends it was a merry town rouen so the time passed i was better but again the medical board at that hospital decided i ought not to return to the front now this showed me a new and painful difficulty i knew that if sent to england by the approved rules of the game this would automatically cause me to be struck off the lists of the british expeditionary force and i should be put back into the home forces more depression and forebodings however i am very fatalistic and i curled up mentally in order to await the day which i knew was coming i e to have a label tied on my tunic directing me to england at last it came and i left that kind hospitable red cross monastery and was shipped with a crowd of others for england we all went on the asturias which most people will remember was subsequently torpedoed the boat was crowded almost entirely with wounded returning from the battle of the somme that great and glorious conflict which cost us so much i had a bunk and a crowded ward on the ship and we were all very cheerful a hospital boat returning to england contains an astonishing amount of cheer and brightness the idea in every man's mind that he is being taken by englishmen back to england and the visions that he sees of dear old blighty are enough to make him cheerful it's the best tonic i know a chap with an arm in a sling and with all his clothes torn to ribbons would be sitting on the side of the bed smoking a stinker and recounting laughing exactly how they all got held up in the barbed wire in front of a bosch machine gun his companion would follow up this story with a grouse that his push had all been north of the battle and he heard all the row going on but hadn't had a look in that's the stuff to give em when the asturias reached southampton we were all put into ambulance trains and sent to various parts of the country my lot was london at midnight i and a few others were removed from the station by motors and taken to a hospital but with the strange coincidence in my case that it was the same hospital which had received me after my blowing up at ypres i entered that hospital at camberwell and when i left cured it was to start on the most extraordinary part of my war life viz my tours round all the fronts before the end of the war i was to see the fronts from the north sea to the adriatic and the backs of the fronts from rome to new york and so i start another chapter end of chapter seventeen recording by philip gould chapter eighteen of from mud to mufti by bruce Barron's father this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18. Sick Leave. Summoned to War Office. Amazing Interview. A Unique Job. In due course I was better, and after going before a medical board I was given sick leave. 
I then went home and wondered about the future. It was goodbye Montrelet. I knew that, but what would be my next job? Back in the old apple and plum, I supposed. I spent two weeks amongst the leafy calm of Warwickshire, getting better every day. In a few days now I should have my final medical board and then report at the headquarters of my battalion reserve depot. The days slid on and I was just about to go through the above formula when the blow fell or the squib exploded or whatever you like to call it. I awoke one morning to find, amongst other letters, a long envelope with OHMS on the cover. I was summoned to London to the war office. Now, my feeling about the war office is almost identical with that one has at school when you are requested to visit the headmaster's study after prep, with a view to being caned. I don't know why, but perhaps it's that wonderful and unique chill which one associates with long, unfurnished stone corridors. The war office is well worth a visit to those who haven't been there. A vast pile with an intricate labyrinth of long, dull-colored corridors, one almost expects to find the mummied corpse of a king when one gets to the center, something like entering the Great Pyramid at Giza. You feel that somewhere in the middle there must be some vast and highly colored potentate, maybe a super-general, who is, perhaps, dead in a sarcophagus, or alive like a queen bee. But anyway, guarded by a host of officials, minor satellites, and girl guides. You, of course, never get near or see this personage. You merely feel the gloom and awe which his presence creates. I haven't been to the war office very often, but I've never lost this sensation. You enter the building and fill up a form. In time you are boisterously told by a Boer War veteran to follow the girl. The girl, a guide of sorts and a dark brown engineer's overall, sets off sullenly down a cement passage with a group of assorted officers pursuing. She, I fancy, revels in the intricacies of these stone catacombs. Having apparently described a complete parallelogram by means of walking round the edifice in a forbidding-looking corridor, you suddenly come upon a lift. It is always disappearing upwards when you arrive, so the whole group silently waits for its return. It comes down suddenly and disgorges an assorted crowd. When, headed up by the girl guide, you enter and are taken up. Now we all repeat the corridors and parallelogram business again. This time you have to abandon trying to realize where you are. Nothing but the girl guide can save you now. Lost in the war office. How awful that would be. I can imagine a visitor having lagged behind the guide a bit, suddenly realizing that he was lost. How he would vainly beat on those stone walls and scream for help. How his skeleton would be found by a typist weeks later in an attitude which evidently showed that he had succumbed while endeavoring to gnaw his way through a door. I followed the guide and after being handed to several officials who take you to other officials, at last came up with THE official, whose duty it was to prevent if possible anyone seeing the officer who had summoned me by letter from my rural retreat. The official took my paper form and reverently asked me to wait a minute. He then disappeared through a door ten feet high and five feet wide and closed it behind him. I now sat on a chair and idly listened to the suburban gossip of a couple of typists which floated out from behind a couple of screens. Have you been to Chu Chin Chow, dear? No, darling. I was going, but something happened. I don't know what. Harold told me he had seen you there. A rattling burst of typewriting indicates that another monstrous door has opened down the passage and a staff officer has come out. He passes the typists and me, carrying an armful of buff-colored papers, then all is still again. My door opens. The official comes out. He beckons me in. I go in. I am in. I hear the ponderous door close softly behind. I am face to face with the occupants of the room. The interview was brief but to the point. I was complimented on the effect of my pictures. I was told that the war office would not only like me to continue as I pleased with my ordinary cartoons, but that I was to be placed in the intelligence department, to be used pictorially for certain work which they wanted done. They then hinted that in the near future they might require me to visit the French and Italian armies and to produce similar work to that which, during many months, had grown out of the mud, as it were, on the British front. I was told of certain work to get on with immediately and initiated into a lot of details dealing with the intelligence department. 
I left the War Office as an official and fully licensed humorous cartoonist, and have continued in that capacity up to the end of the war. I left Whitehall and nearly ran down the street outside. I was so bucked. I went into the old ship, a restaurant which you will find nearly opposite Cox's Bank. Here with a cup of coffee and a gold flake I sat and thought it all over. I looked back at the start of it all, back into those dank, dark days of early 1914 when I, as a very poor and submerged second lieutenant, slushed around the Messines mud and at night drew my first sketches by the light of a candle end stuck on an empty tin, keeping myself warm by the heat of a fire bucket. From that to this, I thought, and I smiled with sadness as I recollected the various ups and downs and trials of those early days. Here I was, now attached to the Intelligence Department of the War Office. The War Office liked my drawings. Overcome with pride, I paid my bill and went across the road to draw as much as I could out of that one pound nineteen and eleven pence that still remained to my credit at Cox's. End of section 18 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 19 of From Mud to Mufti by Bruce Barron's Father. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19 Off to the French Front, Loneliness in Paris, Follies Bourget. Now I want to ask all readers of this book to exonerate me from any charge of egoism. I feel that many will be interested to hear exactly all about what my job as a cartoonist was like and how and where the pictures were drawn. Also, it is necessary for me to give a general idea of the results of the pictures and a variety of personal details if I am to explain fully. The vast mass of letters that I have received from all over the world has emboldened me to put as much as I can of the personal note into these pages. I have felt there are so many who would like to know the inside of fragments from all fronts that I am going to describe the actual work in connection with my drawings, as well as the geographical adventures which led to them. My first return to the continent after the events related in the last chapter was to the French Army. The French Army Intelligence Department applied for me to be sent to their front to live amongst the troops there, and to bring out pictorially, and in my own way, a series of cartoons. At the time this came about as an order, my pictures in The Bystander had been bound into several books under the title Fragments from France, and had had an enormous circulation. The French papers had commented on them, and ultimately the application which I have mentioned above occurred. I went to the War Office, and having received my pass and certain papers, I set off for France. A large and complicated paper had been given to me, amongst others, which told me the number of a certain corps in the French army I had to report to. It said nothing about the part of the line where I should find this corps, but somehow or other I got it into my head that this particular corps lurked about somewhere near Reims or Soissons. After a suffocating all-night journey following a nauseating passage to Boulogne, I arrived at the Garde du Nord in Paris, where I reported to the French Provost Marshal's headquarters. I was shown into an office. A very courtly French colonel explained most politely and gently to me that the corps in question was near Rosendahl. And where is that? I asked. He turned to a large map and pointed a finger practically at Ostend. Heavens! Near Ostend! And here have I come all the way down to Paris. Vision of another long, suffocating journey with a suitcase almost back to where I had started from. I thanked the colonel and returned to the station to find out the trains for the next morning. I really couldn't get into a train again that night. I'll stay the night in one of these pubs here, I thought to myself, and acting on this impulse selected the Hotel Terminus du Nord, which faces the station. Mine was to be a lonely job. During all my wanderings from this date on I was cast for long, solitary train journeys and nights in various hotels, estaminets, and billets all on my own. Here I was now in Paris, just about to have a sample of the kind of evening I have had so many of. I went that night to the boulevards and wandered around. I sat in several cafes, always with my notebook and pencil, and watched the cosmopolitan and semi-military crowd as it moved in an apparently endless stream down the boulevard des Italiens. It was late autumn, and the interior of the cafes was crowded. Looking out from the brightly lighted interior, the street seemed to be a joyous mass of humanity, all forever moving onward. 
I sat back on the frowsy seats, and with a sheet of paper and a drink on the marble-top table in front, followed my customary habit of weaving pictures in the tobacco smoke around. Later I went to the Café de Madrid, and had dinner. Tomorrow I was starting for Rosendahl in the front. After dinner, shunning the dull quiet of the Hotel Terminus du Nord, I decided to go to a show somewhere, and soon concluded that what would be about my mark would be the Follies Berger. So off I went, and after the usual robbery at the entrance, roamed around the palm court, listened to the band, and with the aid of a whiskey and soda watched the fountain squirting water out into the smoke-laden atmosphere. What a mass of women they have in that place, somehow! Gaudy, doubtful women! Fountains and lazy bands form a very curious background to that front, which, not so many miles away, is dealing exclusively in death, toil, and devastation. But here it was, all going strong. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow somebody else dies. There was some show going on at the stage, but as I can't understand a word of French at the speed the natives talk it, I contented myself with absorbing the sights of the palm court. Having sat in the palm court at the Folies Berger, and in kindred theatres a score of times, I have come to the conclusion that there are other dangers besides the trenches. This fancy, it's probably only a stupid hallucination of mine, I have recorded in the shape of a drawing which you will find in one of the books of fragments, namely, Come on, Bert, it's safer in the trenches. I left before the end of the show and walked back to the hotel. Having overhauled my baggage and told a swarthy rogue of a boots to call me in the morning, I went to bed and recuperated for my journey to Rosendahl in the morning. End of chapter 19 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 20 of From Mud to Mufti by Bruce Bairn's Father This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 20 Where Wire Meets Sea Crack Coxide, Cordial Reception, Chilly Quarters. Rosendale is a paltry, unattractive little town near the sea in the Dunkirk direction. I and my suitcase arrived there in due course. I presented myself to the Corps General. He graciously saw me in a chateau just outside the town which he used as his headquarters. He was a very famous French general, but there is no need to mention his name. I showed him my papers, and explained to him at his request exactly what I would like to do. I wanted to go into the French trenches in that sector and thoroughly get into the spirit of what holding that part of the line was like. I also wanted to familiarize myself with the way the French soldiers lived and fought. He quite understood, and gave a few rapid orders to an officer who was in the room. He then told me that he had decided that I should go to a certain division who were at the time holding that part of the line which runs along the Isère Canal, and which had its left flank on the sea. This sounded very interesting, as this sector comprised places of such war historic interest as Dixmude, Newport, Fern, etc. A car was placed at my disposal, and I was whirled off along the flat, bleak, and occasionally poplar-lined roads up towards the front and towards the great Isère Canal, the scene of so much Belgian gallantry. It was very, very cold, and the long drive in the open car as the evening came on was not a particularly exhilarating performance. We at last arrived at a lot of sand hills, amongst which were some scattered villas of the sort that you will inevitably find at Belgian seaside resorts. This place, the driver announced, was Coxide, and this was where the division had its headquarters. My destination at last. Personally, the architecture and total surroundings of a Belgian seaside resort in peacetime I consider fairly unattractive. But under war conditions, I confess that I was bordering on a feeling of absolute revulsion at the general appearance. Cheap stucco and red-tiled villa on a windswept sand hill is bad enough at any time. But when there is a shell hole through the roof, a couple of windows missing, and a corner chipped off, its appearance is still more repulsive. There were a good number of these seaside atrocities standing about, and it was in one of these that I found the divisional commander and all his staff to whom I reported myself. They had heard that I was coming, and as luck would have it, knew all about my pictures, and therefore I was saved the painful explanation which I have from time to time had to indulge in. 
that of telling officials what my work consists of. To explain my business to a man who has never heard of me or my work is a terrible ordeal. The subject is so large, and the whole story so peculiar that I never know where or how to begin. Fortunately, nowadays, there don't seem to be many people who are unaware that there is such an individual existing as Bruce Barron's father, and that he happens to make a series of marks on bits of paper which a kind-hearted world has taken to calling cartoons. Things are not so hard for me now as they used to be, but you can imagine that for some time after I began to draw cartoons it was a bit trying to explain to some fire-eating general who had never heard of me, and whose one bête noire was cartoons, that I was a licensed military cartoonist and wished to be allowed to wander all around his trenches so as to get the atmosphere and feeling of that particular sector. After a life spent in pondering on the theory and value of howitzers, road maps, discipline, and battles, a general is naturally a bit strange to the flimsy unreality and apparent uselessness of art. Oh, yes, I've had some trying times, believe me. However, here at Coxide I was most cordially, understandingly, and enthusiastically received by this French army commander, and my introduction was followed by my being allotted quarters and then going to lunch with the staff. They were a most happy, light-hearted group of officers, and all worked hard. The general himself, a short, thick-set, swarthy, strong man, was one of the brightest and most cheerful ornaments of the mess, a general at his work and a human being when it was over. All the group of officers connected with him were perfectly free and happy at that mess. All was brightness and freedom with, whenever necessary, a rigid and vigorous return to work and hard discipline. I was very much struck with that headquarters mess. I had occasion to have many meals there, and I also saw all the members at work, and was most forcibly impressed by the difference between their headquarters and the equivalent in the English army. Since then, having had similar experiences with the Italian and American armies, I am still more struck with the same difference to our own English equivalent. That frigid atmosphere which some of our headquarters can and do assume is entirely lacking in any foreign army. In any other army but ours, a second lieutenant, when at some off-duty period, say at dinner, can talk with his general and be answered and talked to by his general, like two human beings who have respect for each other's knowledge, each in his own sphere. You will frequently find with us that under similar circumstances a gloomy unintellectual silence is maintained, with an occasional remark from the general which is followed by a sycophantic answer from someone of a rank no lower than a captain, whilst a second lieutenant, if there is one present, munches his toast in dead silence, consigned as he is to unquestionable ignorance at the far end of the table. I've had some myself. No offense meant, only a sight digression on insularity. After lunch at that cockside villa I was taken round and shown where I was to be stabled and from where I would make excursions to the various trenches in the sector. The place I was to live at was a hotel on the seafront. You will notice I say was and I still stick to that word. Of all the chilly, horrible hotels I think this one was the peach. Being almost winter, it was dark when I and my guide got there, and as I was taken up the uncarpeted, creaky, cheap stairs, with a zoov leading the way with a candle stuck in a bottle, I couldn't help thinking how unfavorably the place compared with the Savoy. A long bare corridor with the wind whistling down it through a window with no glass in it greeted us at the top of the stairs. Macbeth's castle was a cozy invalid's home compared with this. The Zoov, with his dark red Turkish-looking hat, led the way. Candle spluttered and blew about in the breeze. We opened a door on the right and the candle went out in the draft. The Zoov entered and readjusted the sheet of sacking across a broken pane of glass in the window at the far end. He then relit the candle and showed me my room. A bed, one chair and a washstand, all made out of a horrible, bilious, yellow-colored wood, and standing on a carpetless floor. Those were the contents, the other attractions consisting of a rattling window and a moldy smell such as one I imagine would associate with a derelict hotel. The Zoov, of course, could speak nothing but French. I can't do much at that, and as I fancy he threw in a little Arabic now and again, I found I could do nothing to establish an entente. I indicated with a smile and a few gestures that I was quite all right now, thanks very much, and leaving me the candle he went away. 
I sat on the bed which was damp from the sea air blowing through the open window. Outside I heard the waves breaking on the shore whilst inside the hotel was emitting a variety of creaky weird noises. The candle, burning with sudden dullness, was standing on the cheap washstand and apparently it was all it could do to illuminate the surface of that unattractive piece of furniture. Here I am at Cockside, and this is where I have got to live with the French soldiers, find ideas, and draw them, I thought to myself. If you knows of a better ole, go to it. There was no better ole, and if there had been I couldn't go to it. So I resigned myself to forthcoming life at Cockside Le Bon. End of chapter 20. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter 21 of From Mud to Mufti by Bruce Barron's Father. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 21. Going the Rounds, Mud and Monotony, Verdun Heroes, Thoughts on Shelling. The next day I began my work. The general had arranged for me to have a guide and to be taken to a regiment that was in front-line trenches to the right and in front of Newport. It was a bleak, grey, dismal day as we went down the long, monotonous, shell-pitted road towards Newport. What a dreary waste that country round the Ezer Canal is, particularly in all the wild, wet weather of winter. We went as far as we safely could in the car, and then walked a short way to the place where the regimental commander lived. He had a fairly large, well-built subterranean dugout, where my guide explained all about me and what I wanted to see and do. It appeared that the colonel had been already rung up on the telephone about me, and he readily grasped the idea. He prepared to come round with us and show us over all his particular command. All through my many visits to the various parts of the stupendous battle line from Ostend to Gorizia, I have been particularly impressed by the willing courtesy shown by the different commanders whom I have had the pleasure of meeting. In spite of the strenuous lives they had to live, they always found time to do all that was possible to show me everything in their power, and were invariably most hospitable. Trench hospitality is a wonderful and touching thing. Every one of my official hosts would turn out extraordinarily good meals in my honor and on many occasions I have known that this must have meant curtailing their own none too luxurious rations. The colonel got ready, gave some orders, and then started to show us round. We followed close behind. I shall never forget that waterlogged dreary waste near Newport. Vast, perfectly flat country, with long, mournful grass waving about in the cold wind under a lead-colored sky. We went along duck boards most of the way, occasionally passing groups of war-worn poilus who were toiling at that everlasting necessity, the battle between men and mud. To these men the colonel would always say something, perhaps praise, perhaps criticism, but to those poor cold wet devils even a harsh corrective word of command must have been a relief. Those winter months on the Yser were a triumph for our Belgian and French allies. We went on, and at last slushed our way into a series of muddy trenches. It is hard for those who have never seen those trenches to imagine the fearful conditions under which the soldiers lived. No worse indeed than what our own army has had to contend with, but they were just as bad as you could want. There is so much marshland in these parts that to make anything but a sloppy bog for your home is nearly impossible. Dark days, mud, rain, danger, and death. When you add these ingredients together and multiply the sum by the length of a whole winter, you'll find it wants a lot of beating. And these were the soldiers. These were some of those amazing fellows who had stuck out so much. These were some of the wonders who had astonished the world by their heroic performance at Verdun. I looked at them all keenly and thought hard as I followed behind the colonel down trench after trench. Here were these splendid men in old dirty uniforms covered with mud, some sitting down on ledges at the back of the mud and sandbag parapet, and others standing about with their hands in their pockets, stamping their feet on the old worn duck boards to keep warm, while others again were occupied on their ceaseless watch for the enemy over the parapet. An English officer following their colonel round was an unusual sight. I was the first they had ever seen there, and they all looked with silent curiosity as I passed, and then muttered something amongst themselves. 
I don't know what they said, but if it had been me I should probably have said, What's this blank fool doing mucking around here? I expect they said that. I hope so. It's human and friendly. I don't know many things more tiring than being shown round miles and miles of trenches. To begin with, you can't walk normally. You always seem to be stepping over things or stooping under things, added to which you have occasionally to do about half a mile in a bent-up attitude because the parapet is low. This latter procedure is advisable owing to a latent desire on the part of those Rhineland gentlemen to snipe your head if it shows. I got tired out that day, but I saw and learnt a lot. I scrambled about in various ditches known technically as communication trenches. I went on all fours into sundry dugouts or trench mortar emplacements. I slushed through hundreds of yards of dirty, marshy, shell-torn ground, tripped on old rusty barbed wire, in fact, saw those trenches thoroughly. We stopped for lunch at the dugout of a company commander, and there we sat round a low table, a survival of some mutilated home close by, and partook of a plain but very welcome ration lunch given to us with the utmost cordiality and hospitality, after which a smoke and a removal of as much mud as one could. They are invariably a cheery and friendly crowd, these French officers, and there is invariably a happy family atmosphere in all French regiments. During this visit of mine to these Newport trenches there was very little shelling or violent interruptions of any kind. A little rifle firing and a little back area strafing, that is all. That form of amusement indulged in by artillery and known as back area shelling consists of lobbing nice, large, juicy shells over the heads of the trench holders way back onto some town, village, camp, or building, occasionally varying this by deluging a certain road so as to make it unattractive, if not impossible to use. Of the various forms of irritant which this war has possessed, I hate shelling most. Against one of those large flying umbrella stands in the shape of a fifteen-inch shell you can do nothing. It's mere delusion to think you are safe in a house, dugout, or cellar. These shells have a persistent and noisy way of penetrating anywhere with the almost inevitable result that you go out either bodily or in pieces. I can laugh, and have laughed, at the rattling splutter of machine-gun bullets against a wall when I have been on the other side. But when those mammoth howitzers start squirting those explosive drain pipes over at you, I confess, my smile fades. That boom, very soft in the distance, then the swirling, rotating, swishing crescendo overhead, the ghastly momentary pause as you see an earth fountain waft a cottage a hundred yards into the air, followed by a crash like a battleship being dropped into Olympia. No! No, I don't like it. These Newport trenches were comparatively quiet that day, but when the time came for us to retrace our steps along the sodden duckboards, I wasn't sorry. They were a clammy, horrible, depressing sight, and very reminiscent to me of those dark, dank trenches I used to live in before Messines. I looked back when we had gone about half a mile. Under the darkening, dreary, wet sky the flat, war-torn country lay in a gloomy silence. The long, waving grass, a skeleton farm roof silhouetted against the lemon-colored light of the setting sun, and beyond the dark, hazy mystery of where those primitive trenches lay and where night after night, week after week, month after month, those muddy, weather-beaten, war-worn poilus forever held the line. End of chapter 21 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 22 of From Mud to Mufti by Bruce Barron's Father This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 22 Methods of Work A Wonderful Tunnel An Airy Bit of Line Back to Coxide My life now consisted in going daily to some new part of the line, seeing different regiments and noting a host of various incidents. At night, back in that drastic hotel by the light of two candles stuck in their own grease, I worked away on my detailed drawings and wrote notes on all the little effects and points which I had observed in character and design amongst the soldiers and in the trenches. I have sketchbooks and notebooks full of the various characteristics of different trenches, localities, and soldiers. Thinking it may interest readers of this book, 
I am having a typical page from one of my sketchbooks reproduced. It is a hurried detail drawing made at about the time of which I have just written. A cracked and deserted cold hotel is not the best studio on earth, but here it was that I collected all the material that I wanted in the way of technical detail. I made no attempt to get ideas for pictures. I never do at this period. I just go in for letting the whole scene and conditions of life soak into my system, live with them all, and feel what it is to live there with them all. Then afterwards, when I come away, a clearer vision of what it was struck me most comes along and then I can carry on. The times I have had in fearful studios. From that dugout where I drew my first Where Did That One Go picture, to a cabin in mid-Atlantic. Incidentally, I have perpetrated sketches in a broken-down estaminet in the Vosges, a swimming bath on the Carso, and a host of other weird and unstimulating spots. I thoroughly investigated that easer area, and will not describe any more of the ordinary trench life there, as it is all much the same everywhere. I will, however, give you an idea of what the line was like in those days on the extreme left. This, by the way, was to me a very interesting spot. This was where the whole battle line ended. The line was, as everyone knows, approximately from Ostend to Belfort. The part I am about to describe was the North Sea end of it all, about eight miles westward from Ostend. Here the trenches ended because of the sea, and the barbed wire defenses of each side ran out into the sea for a finish. This thought amused me. I don't exactly know why. I somehow felt how ridiculous it was for vast numbers of twentieth-century human beings, who more or less all prided themselves on progress and enlightenment, to be facing each other in two long slots in the ground with the ends stopped up one by the North Sea, the other by the Alps. A Zoov regiment was holding these trenches, and I was most interested to see the men and to absorb all the characteristics of the places around. As before we went in a car as close to the line as possible, and afterwards had to walk, but this time we had to leave the car a long way off behind the front. This precaution was very necessary, as a lot of shelling went on here, and the Germans, having a good view from some high sand hills and towers in the distance, were able to send a pretty nasty occasional burst of shelling down into the lines which led to the Zoov trenches. To circumvent this, the regiment had made a long tunnel under the sand over a mile in length. This was really a wonderful piece of work. It was impossible to detect the tunnel from the outside, and yet inside it was big enough for two people to walk abreast, and was completely wood-lined from end to end with electric light and telephone wires running its whole length. The carpentry of it and its general structure were excellent, truly a wonderful bit of work for an infantry battalion to have accomplished. Now and again in the course of its length there was a slot left open on the seaward side from which as you passed you could see the ocean. I went along this tunnel affair and came out at the far end just at the mouth of the Ezer Canal. A few terribly mutilated houses, miniature lighthouses and ruined canal lock gates marked the end of this historic Ezer Canal. Beyond the canal about a thousand yards away were the sand hills which formed the Allied front line. I don't claim to be a military genius but I confess that at the very time I first saw those trenches it struck me as a dangerously airy place to have them, for against the advantage of having got a thousand yards of sand hill beyond the canal towards the enemy, there was the obvious disadvantage that the canal was behind our lines. It was very wide at that part, and moreover supplies were entirely dependent on our being able to maintain intact a series of bridges across the water. I said nothing, of course, and imagined that there was some good reason for our line being thus thrown forward. But subsequently, when we got that very nasty smack from the Huns in these very sand hills, I read the account and saw that the canal and the ruptured bridges had been the cause of the trouble. The Germans had concentrated artillery fire on the only bridges by which reinforcements could come to the aid of the garrison of the sand hills, which was held in a deathly struggle with overwhelming numbers. The Zoovs are a magnificent crowd, and this particular crew had done wonders at Verdun. They were here, resting. Holding these trenches compared to Verdun was indeed resting, but resting in this war has been a much-abused word. 
A few of my pals in the trenches will endorse that sentence, I know. I spent the day crashing about amongst zoavs and sand and began my journey back to Coxide towards evening. I was now accompanied by my guide and a zoav officer. We thought we would chance it and go above ground instead of bothering to walk back along the tunnel. We started off but about three-quarters of a mile back as we walked down the main but completely shattered street of Newport Baines. A shell or two whizzed over our heads and landed with a nasty bang a hundred yards ahead of us. We all thought the tunnel advisable after this. I most certainly did. We dived down a hole in the basement of a house and by means of an underground passage constructed out of a series of cellars reached the tunnel by the sea again. In due course we emerged, and as we got into the car we saw another couple of shells burst in the road we had lately left. We motored off back to Coxide, arriving there without further incident. Before leaving that sector I was taken to see the old city of Newport. I have seen a lot of ruined cities, but this one wants a deal of competing with for thorough ruination. I asked the Commandant, more jokingly than otherwise, if there was such a thing as a whole unbroken house in the town. He said that a careful examination had been made and it had been found that there was not. The town was in a fearful mess. Every house was knocked to pieces and the streets were a mass of shell holes. The town hall and church were appalling wrecks. I took a lot of photographs, made sundry sketches and left. I left by moonlight and an eerie sight it was. A clear night and a large full moon shining down on the deserted, ruined, silent city. Far away in the trenches out in front an occasional rifle shot would cause a harsh echo among the still cold ruins as they stood there under the moon. End of chapter 22 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 23 of From Mud to Mufti by Bruce Bairn's Father this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 23 An Invitation to Dinner In Paris Again Off to Verdun Bar le Duc My time in this North Sea area was drawing to a close. I had got all I wanted, a crowd of impressions and a forest of detail. Now came the big event, the star turn, the thing I was longing to do. I was now to go to Verdun. Verdun, with all its epic story of cast-iron endurance and its mighty battles. Verdun, the Ypres of the French army. I was glad, in a way, to leave the damp and dismal Rosendale sector, but I was sorry to leave the jolly, friendly crowd of French officers at Coxide who were more than good to me. Before leaving I received an invitation on which I will say a few words. I was invited to dine with Prince Alexander of Teck, who lived over at La Panne, and was the British representative with the King of the Belgians. His senior staff officer was a friend of mine, and I went over one night and enjoyed a very pleasant evening. I had the honor of sitting next the Prince, who told me a lot of interesting things about the sector and the Belgian army. I mention this dinner, you see, to show that I didn't always live on bully beef and dugouts, but now and again glided off up into the realms of table d'hote. This pleasant little episode happened just before I left. Another invitation to go to the naval division who operated some venomous-looking naval guns in the sand hills close by I had to cancel, as I was leaving for Paris. After a variety of small bothers, such as getting one's papers and authority to proceed, etc., I left Rosendale for Paris. I went to the French authorities and saw an intelligence department lieutenant who gave me a couple of reams of paper entitling me to go to Verdun. I managed to snatch a night in Paris. I wanted something to contrast with the joys of the Rosendale mud wastes. What a rotten thing loneliness in great cities is. One night is quite enough for me, but circumstances have caused me to have a great many. After one evening in Paris I started for Verdun. I rattled off from my hotel in one of those reckless petrol-driven bathing machines known as taxis, and having paid my yehu a hundred percent over his fare, daren't argue as I don't know enough French, I walked into the station. It's a mighty station is the Gare de l'Est, and I have never seen it without its being packed to suffocation with people. 
all the Paris stations seemed to be the same during the war. One large, seething mob of soldiers, civilians, women, and children. Trains about a mile long are always standing at the platforms and are allowed about two hours to load up with passengers. They seem to believe in a few trains of staggering length to a greater number of reasonable proportions. My heart bleeds for the engine that has to start pulling that enormous dead weight out of the station. I'm sure the station master must give the train a bit of a shove so as to make things easier. It is very rarely that I have managed to evade carriages with eight aside, the floor covered with baggage, and a family of assorted babies sprawling over it. I have done hundreds of miles in a carriage like the Black Hole of Calcutta. This journey to Verdun was crowded but minus babies. I think that sector is unsuitable for babies, but it apparently deals largely in farm laborers who seem to live exclusively on garlic and onions. At least so I surmise from my traveling experiences and a keen sense of smell. A boisterously healthy swarthy Hercules with a luxuriant mustache will sit in a first-class carriage and open a parcel in which is wrapped a lunch, enough to feed a platoon. Then, with a brigand like pocket-knife, he will proceed to cut cheese against a monstrous dirty thumb, looking blandly out of the window with eyes like the soul's awakening. It was just such a journey as this that I made towards Verdun. You can't go the whole way to Verdun by train, only as far as bar le -Duc. Then hope for the best. I arrived at bar le in the evening and was motored out that night to a certain army headquarters which was established in an old stone town hall in a small town. An effective romantic sort of a place. I remember noticing a lot of shields and old historical spears hung on the walls. Everything was very solid and gloomy. I was told what was the procedure necessary before being allowed to enter and see Verdun. In about half an hour I was in the French staff car again and being motored back to bar le -Duc. It was late at night when I got there and I found a room in one of the few hotels in the main street. Somehow the whole air seemed charged with a quaint air of excitement and mystery. bar le -Duc tonight, and tomorrow I was to be called for and taken to Verdun. I was mighty keen on this visit. Verdun spelt to me such a mysterious romantic charm, and at this time the world was echoing the great story of the ceaseless German attacks and the amazing tenacity of the French troops in holding the town and the salient. Verdun, Douaumont, Vaux. All magic, terrifying names, each one conveying a wealth of martial meaning to every man and woman in France. One big story of the courageous spirit of undefeatable France and one big necropolis for the Germans. I spent a fairly reasonable night in a fairly reasonable hotel, and when daylight broke again I prepared myself for my visit to the mighty fortress of Verdun. End of section 23. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter 24 of From Mud to Mufti by Bruce Bairn's Father. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 24 Verdun Underground Halls Death and Devastation A large French staff car appeared before the hotel at about nine o'clock in the morning. I left with a French officer guide and a chauffeur. The road was long and winding, and it is a famous road, that being the main artery which feeds the salient. As we went along we passed an incessant stream of motor lorries proceeding in both directions. A vast traffic was here, I could see, and my mind immediately flew to the thoughts of the mighty mechanism behind it all. Long, apparently never-ending streams of motor lorries carrying food and ammunition, followed by another stream carrying fresh soldiers for the fray. The backward freight consisted of battle-worn poilus being taken back for short but urgent rest. The road was charged with all the tense electrical seriousness of the great battles of Verdun. Our car dashed along past all this traffic, and I gathered from the milestones we would soon be inside of the historic city. At last we were there. We entered under a huge stone-built gateway giving entrance through the walls of the citadel. Guards challenged us and looked at our passports. All was well, and entering the town we proceeded slowly along. Huge, massive walls were on either side walls built for defensive purposes at a very much earlier date. 
we stopped at an arched dark opening on the left this opening was the entrance to a massive stone tunnel and led to the interior of the underground fortress we got out of the car and the french officer led me into the tunnel that underground system at verdun is truly wonderful long electrically lit passages take one into great arched stone halls where there is room and equipment for everything and everybody we went along a series of passages and up sundry stone stairs down others more passages until we arrived at the quarters of the french general commanding the citadel here i was introduced to the general and my visit explained the general expressed a wish to show me the town and fortress that day this more than pleased me as of course i wished to see everything and as soon as possible the general ordered his car round and was good enough to ask me to come with him on a tour of inspection we drove slowly through the town it was impossible for the germans to see into the town as they had been prevented from gaining the heights commanding the place but from the monstrous shell-holes and demolition round I saw clearly that they went in for extensive shelling on the off-chance of making themselves a nuisance. I was shown a lot of the interesting historic buildings of Verdun, all more or less knocked about. The old walls of the city were very curious. The terrific shelling had blown away so much masonry and so many houses that another set of ancient walls had been exposed to view. Verdun is a most ancient town and has a very great historical interest. Mr. Attila and his Huns originally dashed through this place in their customary rude and pushing way, and were ultimately defeated utterly at chalon sur marne which is not very far away. I went into the cathedral. Such a pitiful mess it was in. Piles of smashed and twisted metal, originally priceless wrought ironwork, were lying on the chipped and scarred stone floor. The great decorative domed ceiling had a huge gaping shell hole in it, whilst several of the altars were torn and lacerated by shrapnel. It is a very ancient cathedral, and is most massive and magnificent in structure. We spent the rest of the day cruising around the various spots of interest in the city. Verdun stands on the Meuse and is surrounded by a series of hills, all about two miles away from the town and all held by the French. It was these hills that the Germans were after, and had they ever got them they could have dominated the town and knocked the bottom out of all the defenses. This they were precious near doing at one time, but the magnificent courage and heroic endurance of the French were too much for them. Towards evening we drove back to the underground department. The general invited myself and my officer guide to dinner that night, and ordered someone to show me where I was to sleep. I was led into a sort of dormitory full of wooded cubicles. One of these was to be mine. I sat on my bed and made some notes and rough sketches, then had a wash and brush up for dinner. At a little before the time, a French soldier called for me, something like the jailer coming for the doomed man to take him to the scaffold. I followed this soldier to my doom. We went down another set of maze-like passages and ultimately entered the dining room. A huge vaulted hall, with several rows of tables, met my gaze. The room was rapidly filling with a great number of French officers. The whole scene was full of life and bustle. The pulsating flicker of rather yellow electric light flooded the place. Soldier servants and cooks were working with enthusiastic vigor at preparing the feast. Two tables ran down the center of this vaulted hall and one across the top end at right angles to the other. The room was soon full, and the general entered. He took his seat at the center of the top table and summoned me to sit beside him. The dinner started. I wished he had let me be at the far end of the junior officer's table or amongst the cooks and waiters. High places at these functions always end in my eating nothing. A great rattling roar of people talking and eating now filled the place, and I worked hard at my poor French to evolve sentences for the benefit of the general and the other officers round about. I'm sure that dear old general mistook me for an ambassador or something. At the end of dinner he made a speech referring to me in the middle of it, and later on a band played God Save the King, during which I had to bear the scrutiny of about two hundred pairs of eyes whilst all stood to attention. I was honored, but uncomfortable. The evening concluded in a most cordial and happy way with a smoking concert. The next few days I spent in examining the outer defenses of Verdun. 
I went to see the famous forts of Douaumont and Vaux. I was shown where the various German attacks had been beaten, and all the ground over which the French had fought during those long anxious months which were vital to the whole cause of the Allies. And what a dreadful country it was! I looked out from Souville Fort on to the ground around Fleury and Douaumont. The land seemed to radiate nothing but an atmosphere of death and decay from its dull brown shell-churned surface. As I looked, heavy shells were bursting continuously over the French advance trenches and over the broken remains of Douaumont Fort. Souville marked the spot that had proved a Waterloo for the Germans. Out on the ground in front lay the unburied remains of many who had fallen, and everywhere the ground was littered with old rusty broken rifles, bayonets, and bombs. Mud was everywhere in gigantic quantities, and everything within sight seemed to be blasted and destroyed. A truly ghastly sight was this land around those outer forts, steeped as it was in all the full fury of the worst kind of war that man could make. As I anticipated, this Verdun salient was quite on a par with the horror of Ypres. I picked up an old bayonet to take away with me as a souvenir, and it now hangs with other trophies in my Warwickshire home. We had just left Souville to return and had hardly gone thirty yards when a heavy shell crashed alongside the place where we had been standing. Almost immediately the woods behind seemed to burst into life with French guns barking more death and more destruction at the Germans. And so that relentless argument went on, and day after day the death-charged atmosphere reigned over the Verdun salient, ultimately bringing the world's greatest disappointment to Germany and its gospel of brute force. I was glad to leave that area. It was a long time before I could forget the horrible look of that unearthly ground before the forts. We returned through the mutilated Souville forest into Verdun. I went to see the general, and thanking him very much for the facilities he had so kindly granted me, awaited the car to take me away. I was glad now and very pleased with things in general. I had spent a night in Verdun and had seen it all. This seemed to form the cap to my interesting French army experiences. Now I would return to Paris and then to England after which I should begin my series of drawings from the French front. I had seen them in comparative quiet on the Yser, and in hell at Verdun. I knew their story. I knew their feelings and outlook. I was charged with the atmosphere and had amassed a great volume of detail. My job was over for the present. Now for civilization, by which I mean escape from the devastating mental nausea of the war areas. The car came round and took me to Bar-le-Duc, from where I went by train to Paris. In a few days I was back in England once more. End of chapter 24 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 25 of From Mud to Mufti by Bruce Barron's Father This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 25 Supplying Copy a crowded existence, ordered to Italy. All through these wanderings and adventures I was always at work on my weekly contributions to the bystander. I worked in any old place that I could find, and by means of a compact portable set of implements and paints, spread myself out into an artist in a studio. From the day I began to the present time I have never missed getting a drawing back somehow or other to the bystander offices in time for the weekly publication. Once or twice I got men going on leave to England to take a parcel and post it in London, and once, when I drew a picture in my cabin somewhere off Newfoundland, I got the Turkish bath attendant on the ship to post it on his return to Liverpool. So you see, what with my own precarious existence followed by the equally precarious posting and delivery, those weekly cartoons have seen a bit of life before they emerged in the paper. Having returned from this French visit, I started out full steam ahead to work out my finished pictures, and in due course they were completed. I have a sort of idea that a lot of people imagine that this job of mine is a delightful, easy, and simple occupation. This sort of thing. Fancy! How topping it must be to be a cartoonist! Nothing to do but draw pictures, no fighting, only going on visits to the fronts and making jokes. Isn't he a lucky chap? In case I am right, and this idea undoubtedly does prevail, I will tell you the real story. 
First of all, it would have been wholly and completely impossible for me to have made one joke or drawn one line on the subject had I not originally been burnt in the fire of the war and badly burnt, too. My life in the original mud and the consequent strafing pain and anguish were the foundations of my war drawings. If I had started life in any other capacity than the infantry, these drawings would have been impossible. No amount of looking at the war is any good. You must have been in it, with a darn good chance of never leaving it. I believe this to be the one and only reason for the popularity of my war drawings. Following this initial necessity comes the actual work. Few can realize how much and how hard it is, and nobody except myself and a very intimate few will ever know what I have been through. Work of this class has to be in your system all the time. You don't leave an office at six o'clock, as it were, and then forget all about your work till nine o'clock the next morning. For over three years now I have done on average three or four drawings a week, out of which possibly two have been what I thought suitable to use. Added to this, I have been deluged with letters and autograph albums from all parts of the world. These cannot be ignored, and I have always done my best to get all such applications attended to in some way or other. Each drawing takes me about two days to complete. In the spare time resulting on all this, I have worked on another book, Bullets and Billets, a forerunner of this volume. I have written the play entitled The Better Ole, also one or two short theatrical sketches. Add to all this innumerable drawings for charities of all kinds, and you will observe that I have had rather a crowded existence. And by the time it is realized that the material for all these activities has been collected by personal visits to the war zones on all the fronts, with the consequent fatiguing journeys and hard fare, you will see that to be Bruce Barron's father has been an intricate and arduous job. But I am lucky, though. I fully appreciate that. Here I am at the end of the war with a complete set of component parts. Two legs, two arms, two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. How many of my pals have been less fortunate? After a short session of work in England, I was told by the war office that I was shortly to go to the Italian front. I was most elated at this, as I was longing to see Italy in the war there. The accounts of the fighting on the Carso and in the mountains seemed to be so full of interest compared with the mud scrambles in France. Italy, with its warm sun and bright days. I felt things couldn't be quite so bad there as elsewhere and that the grandeur of the scenery would outweigh a lot of the nasty parts which are inseparable from visits to war zones. I was keen on the Italian job, and presently the day arrived when I was to start. I went to the war office and was told a lot of things that I must observe, and details in connection with my journey. I got my passport and papers and went back to my hotel. Here I overhauled my props, and having procured various articles I wanted for my work, I left Charing Cross on my way to Italy. Same old Folkestone and Boulogne journey, with Paris to follow. I arrived at the Gare du Nord, Paris, and dragged myself and baggage into the same old hotel. I always make for railway hotels as they are generally more up in the trains, and in my case are easier to do things from. The next morning I drove off in a taxi for the Gare de Lyon, there to catch a train for the frontier on my way to Italy. End of chapter 25. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter 26 of From Mud to Mufti by Bruce Barron's Father. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 26. En route to Milan. Hotel Brigands. Spaghetti. On to Udine. By some extraordinary lucky chance I got a seat in the train. The usual trouble was prevailing, and you almost needed a shoehorn to get the last few people into that train. We pushed off. It's a beautiful journey, the run from Paris to Milan. First of all, of course, one passes down through the best part of France. Trees, meadows, old towns, villages, and chateaux. Right down through the center of France one goes, and then comes the Riviera. Splendid scenery here. At last the train reached Modine. This place is a very important feature en route to Italy, as it is the frontier station, and here in wartime it was necessary to change trains. In the days before the war one could go from Paris to Rome without a change, but now it was different. 
I got out at Modine and was crowded, pushed, and banged about on a super-crowded platform in an endeavor to board the train which was to take me on to Italy. The scenery had all changed now. Huge mountains on either side and the line running along cuttings in the sides of the cliffs over precarious-looking bridges or through long tunnels. This was Italy. Everything looked different now, even the character of the houses. I was mighty pleased to have got as far as this on the journey. We went on through a host of wonderful mountain sites and arrived at Turin. I call it Torino at times, like the Italians. Sounds well, I think. Turin is a fine, bright-looking town. I didn't stop there but went on to Milan, which brought me to the end of the first half of my journey. Udine on the Carso was my destination, but a pause in Milan was necessary for the purpose of picking up a train to that area. I wasn't sorry, either. Milan is good enough for me for twenty-four hours. I got out of the train and was nearly bitten in half by a swirling mass of hotel porters. Brigands in all sorts of uniforms with the name of their hotel written in gold letters round a military hat. I got my back against the train, and turned to face my attackers. Effect. Horatius Cockles defending his suitcase. I didn't know which hotel would suit me best, so I got out of the difficulty by asking in French which hotel was nearest the station. A tall, dark, thin outlaw immediately sprang at me and grabbed my baggage. He evidently was unquestionably the clutching hand belonging to the nearest hotel. The rest of the group looked menacingly at this man and sulkily began to move off. Some, however, still skulked along close to me and my porter as if there might be a chance that either I should change my mind or that the porter would drop my baggage, in which case they would spring in and seize it. One swarthy child of Milan followed me and my porter right across the station square outside, keeping up a seductive barrage of Italian as to the absurdity of my going to any other hotel but his, and occasionally glancing venomously at my own porter with all the hate and vendetta of ages in his eyes. I suppose that after trains have come in and travellers have been dragged in to the various hotels, these men go to some lonely spot and fight it out. The mortality amongst foreign hotel porters must be terrible. My hotel was quite a nice one, and the management could speak English. This, of course, is a blessing to one who doesn't know a word of Italian. A good mixture of French and English can get you to most places nowadays, though. It was a beautiful evening when I arrived at Milan, and the whole scene was most pleasing. The feeling of the South was borne in upon me strongly. My mother has told me that I was born somewhere in India. For several years I lived there, and I fancy that the frying I had in the days of my infancy has never quite got out of my system. I love the sun, and warm, balmy breezes. One seems to be able to swell out two sizes larger in that sort of a climate, and to look altogether more blandly and lazily on life. I had dinner outside, on a sort of terrace where all the tables were set, and remember being most interested in an Italian officer dining at a table a few feet away. The object of my interest was his marvellous dexterity with his macaroni, or rather spaghetti. I didn't dare to eat mine after watching him. He could dip a fork into about a hundred weight of this stuff in a bowl in front of him, and bring it out with a tight knot wound round the end. My fork had a lot of strings dangling from the prongs like a dozen anemic worms. He could do it every time with deadly precision. Practice, I suppose. Before going to Italy again I shall attend a college and take a spaghetti course because one is always up against having to eat this stuff there. I wandered round Milan and went, of course, to see the cathedral. I mingled with the crowds, taking their evening strolls, sat about in various cafes, and had a touch of the lonely nuisance again. It is extraordinary how, when one is by oneself in a crowded city, everyone else seems to have someone to be with or to talk to and all are apparently laughing in your face with the sheer joy of life. I liked Milan, but was anxious to get along up to the front and see the wonders of the war in the mountains. The next morning I caught the train for Udine. From Milan to Udine takes the best part of a day. Udine is on the Carso, and at that period was very close to the front, which ran from Monfalcone on the Adriatic through Gorizia up towards the mountains. You might miss Venice by about twelve miles on your right on the journey to Udine. I arrived that evening and drove from the station in an open tumble-down carriage to the headquarters of the British Mission. I drove sedately behind what sounded like a three-legged horse looking at the town as I passed. A very old place is Udine, 
full of odd corners and ancient monuments. The Romans spread themselves a good bit around here in days gone by. I found the British mission headquarters and reported myself. There was a British general there who helped me very much during my visit to the Italian front. He was head of the mission, and as such was very much in touch with the Italian Army Command. I dined with the general that night, and he very kindly set about making arrangements for me to visit various parts of the front, beginning on the morrow. I was given a room in the building, which had been appropriated as the mission's billets, and passed off into a pleasant sleep, dreaming mostly of spaghetti, hotel porters, generals, and Alps. End of chapter 26. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter 27 of From Mud to Mufti by Bruce Barron's Father. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 27. Arrival on Carzo. Bersaglieri. A heated war. Tranquil Udine. It wasn't long before I started my examination of the Italian front. The next morning the general very kindly arranged for me to go down in a car to see life on the Carso. He had it all fixed up with the Italian authorities, and I was free to go right up to the front towards Trieste. We set off in an English car and made for some spot with a name something or other like Sarsaparilla, in order to see a famous regiment of Bersaglieri, who were then in trenches south of Gorizia. Any liking I had for warmth and sunshine was fully gratified here. It was scorching hot. The roads were white with burning dust, the trees simply frizzling in the summer sun. To touch the leather upholstery or the metal sides of the car was nearly impossible. The heat was immense. Fighting battles in this weather must be a poor line, I thought, and now was to come my first view of the Italian army in the field. I conjured up ideas founded mostly on colored pictures I had seen of the famous Bersaglieri with their plumed hats and gallant charges across open country shouting soul-stirring phrases as they pushed heroically forever onward, the flag of Italy waving proudly in the breeze. I arrived on the Carso and found apparently a group of organ grinders playing cards under a tree, all very swarthy, healthy, and happy. These are Bersaglieri, said my officer guide. You should never go by appearances. A guard's parade outside Buckingham Palace is a very sorry indication of the same regiment and billets behind Ypres. These Bersaglieri were resting, and even if they weren't, they did the battle business minus any of the highly colored heroism beloved of artists. Those wonderful plumed hats, where were they? Back in Milan or Rome, I suppose, in a wardrobe with camphor bags. There was a great mob of these men sitting about under shrubs and trees in the blazing heat. The trenches were a short way off, being held in shifts, as it were. There was no shelling, no rifle fire. A delightful calm Italian day with the sun shining down on the tranquillity of the Carzo. This is the sort of war I like, much better than that noisy, dangerous, running about, waterlogged, ploughed fields I had been used to. Unfortunately, I found it had not always been like this. There had been some terrific scraps with the Austrians around this spot, and I was shown how far these people had been driven back. The Bersaglieri, which are some of the finest troops in Europe, had, to put it plainly, wiped the floor with the Austrians around there, and had suffered very heavily in doing so. I went all around that area and saw thousands of Italian soldiers, some resting, some in the trenches. They are a wonderfully swarthy, healthy crowd. But what a different landscape to fight in from our front. Instead of the sticky mass of sloppy sandbags along the edge of a narrow canal which constitute the normal trench on the western front, these men had nothing but rocks and sand to deal with. The Carso has about two inches of soil over solid rock, so you can imagine what making trenches is like. Moreover, when a shell lands on ground like this, the resulting explosion is greatly augmented by flying bits of rock. The first thing that struck me about the Carzo itself was what on earth did anybody want to fight about it for? I would willingly give it away if I owned it. It's a huge, barren, rocky desert. That's all. The part I was now inspecting was just opposite Gorizia. To the south lay Trieste, and it was possible to see from the place I was in the mountainous difficulties lying between the Italians and the capture of that city. There is a nasty-looking mountain called the Armada, which is right in the way of a march on Trieste. 
the italians had made wonderful progress prior to my visit but were now sitting down a bit to consider what was the best way to snooker the austrians who had fortified this hermada with howitzers and barbed wire to an alarming degree a day doesn't go very far when one starts looking at a front i spent the whole of this first day squinting about round this one regiment its trenches and its billets and in the wonderful italian evening drove back to udine those warm southern days breed wondrous evenings there is a still clear warmth under the glorious deep night blue the people are all sitting outside their houses and everything is bathed in a sort of venetian tranquillity when I got back it was about six o'clock, and I went out for a prowl around the town. I have most pleasing memories of Udine, so picturesque and so tranquil, except for the fact that there were a good many assorted kinds of Italian soldiers strolling about, you wouldn't have known there was a war on. The architecture, too, was old-world and pleasing. A lot of Roman effort still remained in a goodly sprinkling of the Venetian period. What bold lads those Romans were! I stood bashfully in the main square of the town looking at a group of nude statues, and dwelt upon the lack of YMCA's and the absence of Mrs. Grundy in the days of Vespasian. They are a happy, healthy crew, these Italians, and I've half a mind to live in Udine when I retire. I had dinner in some café or other, and sat out in the courtyard under the wonderful sky. A distant song, or perhaps a mandolin being played, was the only noise which broke on that calm evening air. In this curious unwarlike scene, full of all the beauty of this wonderful land, I couldn't help visioning my past career in the war. How little I thought as I went forth to the war, an impecunious submerged second lieutenant, that one day I should see all the fronts, have dinners with the great ones, and be sitting in the character of a freelance under the southern evening sky in old Udine. I even thought farther back still back to the weird dark abyss in my life when as an electrical engineer earning two pounds ten shillings a week i returned in a wood pulp carrying ship from canada just in time to participate in this mighty conflict if someone had come to me whilst i sat on that ship with the cook who was peeling potatoes and told me that one day i should be having dinner with the duke of milan in an old italian garden near venice i should have told him to go to well never mind anyway i shouldn't have believed him it's a comic world, but there are times when the comedy is hard to see, and yet these things have actually happened to me. I wandered back to my billets late at night and keenly awaited the next day. I was to go to see Monfalcone, which was the nearest point possible to Trieste, and there would be able to survey the whole of the battle line which meant so much to Italy. I should also be able to get a distant view of Trieste which can be seen from Monfalcone. This, then, was my program for the following day. End of chapter 27 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 28 of From Mud to Mufti by Bruce Barron's Father This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 28 Monfalcone Camouflaged Roads A Peep at Trieste the car turned up in good time, and the officer guide and myself were driven off in the direction of Monfalcone. On the way we stopped at the interesting old village of Aquilia. This is the site of an old Roman town of the same name, and contains a wonderful old church dating from that period. Part of this church was once a Roman swimming bath or something of the kind, and had an amazing mosaic floor. When I was there, some antique employees of the church were endeavoring to restore this marvelous floor, which had been broken and obscured in many parts. Restoring it consisted mainly in searching through endless piles of rubbish for the minute particles of mosaic and piecing them together. Solving a jigsaw puzzle is child's play compared to this. Outside the church, in a charming cypress tree graveyard, one of the ancient walls had a large marble slab fixed to it bearing a short inspired verse by Gabriel de Nunzio, the famous Italian poet. A few minutes afterwards I saw the poet himself inside the church looking round its ancient, inspiring relics. We went on from here to Monfalcone. Monfalcone, what a mess it was in. Here was the same old war that I knew tangled masses of plaster iron and brickwork that once were houses it is a typical italian looking town and before being demolished in this way must have been a pleasant spot to live in 
Judging by the look of the camouflaged roads which we encountered on the way there, the Austrian artillery must have been a big nuisance. The town, of course, was entirely denuded of civilians, which fact was very apparent as we drove through its deserted streets. We had to be careful, though, as at any moment a bother might break out and a lively shelling commence. The car was left at a good hidden spot, where chances of its being hit were remote, and we got out to walk the rest of the time. We examined the town and I made sundry sketches and took a few photographs, nothing but ruin and desolation everywhere. Now for the docks. That was the star turn of Monfalcone, which boasts of quite a big shipping yard situated, of course, on the Adriatic. The docks are some way from the town, so we fished the car out again for this job. We drove down an elaborately camouflaged road. These are just ordinary roads with a screen constructed from a kind of rush matting fixed up on the side nearest the enemy. The appearance of these roads from a distance is just like the rest of the country. Of course, this doesn't prevent the enemy from firing at such roads which they know exist, but it prevents deliberate aim at a definite object and therefore it would probably be a sheer waste of shells to fire on the off chance of hitting something. It's not a very nice sensation driving along these camouflaged roads, but there it is, and the danger is not really great. We reached the outskirts of the docks, hid the car, and walked on to them. We had now arrived at the nearest point for a view of Trieste. It was a stifling hot day. A blazing sun shone out of a cloudless blue sky with true southern vigor. The ground had that trembling haze over it from the heat. We entered the shipbuilding sheds, and the first thing that caught my eye was a bit of machinery stamped with the name of a famous English firm of shipbuilding engineers. I roamed about all over these yards. Several Austrian submarines, all rusty and derelict and dry dock, caught my eye. The Austrians had shinned off out of Monfalcone very quickly and had been obliged to leave these things behind them. We were joined by an Italian officer or two who knew all about this place. They led us further into the maze of silent, deserted dockyards. I listened to an unintelligible torrent of sound from one of these men who was talking to my officer guide. When interpreted, I found it meant that there was a large half-finished liner in the docks, inside which the Italians had made an observation post, and from which it was possible to get the best view of Trieste. I was keen on this, so we all made for the ship. It was a monster. A great wall of rusty iron plates seemed to spring out of the earth and tower upwards above our heads. We walked alongside this metallic mammoth and arrived at a set of wooden steps which ran up its side. I followed the others up this stairway, temperature about 400 degrees, I should think. It was a real scorching day. Impossible to touch the iron side of the ship without burning your fingers. The ladder led us up onto some deck or other, and we proceeded along a dark corridor towards the sharp end of the boat, by which I mean the part farthest from the rudder. The walk down this stifling corridor being over, we arrived at a sort of wooden hut built up inside the ship and turned into a telegrapher's and observer's office. The heat here was almost unbearable. The sun was streaming down on this huge iron box of a ship, and inside there was not a breath of air. It was all I could do to evince an interest in Trieste. Someone handed me a pair of German binoculars, and I looked out through a narrow slot cut in the side of the ship. I saw Trieste. It was about as interesting as seeing Tunbridge Wells from Clapham on a clear day. However, I didn't want to dishearten the Italians in their quest, so I remarked that it was very interesting. One could just see a lot of blue hills with a town of the Monfalcone order, only larger, at their base. I turned away from the slot in the ship's side and handed the binoculars to someone else to have a look. The close, oppressive heat was terrific. I had seen Trieste and that was enough for me. When every one of the party had satisfied his gloating ambitions by looking at Trieste, we returned from the ship to the car. No shelling interrupted our movements. All was silent, hot, and rusty in that shipyard. We bade farewell to the officers who had kindly shown us round, and then drove back towards Udine. I knew the war in the plains fairly well by now, and subsequently had several experiences in the way of seeing more trenches and more troops. I went to all sorts of battalion headquarters and saw the Italian soldiers in every phase of their life on the plains. By the time I had seen all this, I felt I knew the war on the Carso. 
Gorizia, Monfalcone, Udine, Trieste, all this was a definite story to me. Now for what I was after most, the war in the mountains. I applied to the authorities for permission and extorted a promise that I should go there. I waited in Udine for the day on which I should be permitted to start, and in the meantime was invited to a famous dinner which I must really describe. End of chapter 28 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter Twenty Nine of From Mud to Mufti by Bruce Barron's Father. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Nine, An International Dinner, Off to the Mountains, My Ducal Guide, A Precipitous Motor Drive. Udine was the Italian general headquarters at this time. Consequently, if any foreign powers had representatives with the Italians, they were located there. Well. The Italian army did suffer from foreign representatives, and whilst I was at Udine I found a nest of them, consisting of English, French, Russian, Belgian, Romanian, Serbian, and Japanese. So you see, the Italians were not hard up for encouragement from their allies. It was the custom once a week for a dinner to be given to this assembly at a certain chateau in the town, and whilst in Udine I was honored by being asked to join these functions. I went once, and that once I will describe. I should have gone more often, only as I have hinted previously in this book, I prefer a sausage and mash in a pub round a corner to a table de oat at the Ritz. I hate meals elaborated by means of marble pillars, sycophantic head waiters, and publicity. This international dinner was a fearfully swell affair. It was held in a beautiful garden behind this old world chateau and was really a most picturesque sight. An old Venetian chateau which possessed an equally old garden and a lawn with a border of tall dark cypress trees surrounding it. On the lawn was a long dinner table, and there prior to dinner the international guests assembled. One by one the guests arrived, and what a sight! Each one in the full peacetime uniform affected by his particular army. I had, of course, to turn up in khaki, which had a miserably sombre effect in the midst of so much grandeur. By dinner time the lawn was a mass of different colored cloth and gold braid. A circus procession was tawdry compared to this. Again, another axiom which experience has taught me. The gaudiness of uniform is inversely proportional to the size and importance of the power. A haughty stiffness filled the air, partly due to the starch in these fancy dresses, and partly due to the different languages. In time we all folded at the middle and sat down to dinner. I had an Italian officer on my right, a Romanian general on my left, a Cossack officer and a Serbian ADC opposite. I can talk only English properly, with merely a diabolical attempt at French, so you can imagine that the soup went down amidst almost complete silence. As I gazed at the Cossack shaved head in gray uniform I made a mental note. Sausage and mash at a cafe in Udine for you, me lad, in the future. The dinner progressed with all the polite stiffness inseparable from these orgies. But the scene was certainly romantic and picturesque. A wonderful setting sun behind the cypress trees, the dark olive green lawn, and these mighty ones in their fancy dresses. I again thought of that mud hole in the trench near Messines and realized what a long way I had come. All these allied representatives dispersed each day to various offices and represented their different countries, which, to boil it down, I feel sure means being a damned nuisance to the Italian army headquarters, who of course had to diplomatically please them and at the same time get on with the war. Am I right, Cadorna? After this one visit to see the sea lions fed, I decided I would not be lured into that again. I, in my customary suit of solemn khaki, was a damper on this wonderful kaleidoscopic color display. Besides, dinner in a café in Udine, with a gold flake and coffee to follow, was much more in my line. I now waited for the day on which I was to go off to the mountains. One morning I heard all about it. I was to go with the Duke of Milan, who was at the Italian Army headquarters. We were to start in a car and stay some days with the Alpine regiments who were in the line up in the Dolomite Alps. This was splendid. The Duke was an exceedingly nice companion who talked English, 
and the Dolomites were what I particularly wanted to see. The day arrived and we set off. We whirled along over the dusty flat roads heading for the mountains. In the distance one could see the mighty forms of the red-colored Dolomites towering high above with their snow-capped peaks. With my faculty for seeing the ridiculous and the sublime, I could not help thinking that they looked like a row of gigantic strawberry ices. We got nearer and nearer to the mountain region, and at last began to leave the baking hot plains and mount the foothills which led to the mountains. We drove along the narrow winding roads, past innumerable beautiful villages, now and again passing over a bridge and a raging torrent of emerald-colored water. The atmosphere was, needless to say, as clear as crystal, and as we gained in height the great heat diminished. Occasionally we would pass a stream of motor lorries on their way to or from some part of the battle line, and now and again we would nearly collide with an Italian staff car which was doing its usual ninety miles an hour round impossible corners. Higher and higher we went, always spiraling upwards along the mountain roads. It seemed an endless drive. One seems to have to do so much road work to get such a little distance, always going round and round the same mountain to get to a point you have seen half an hour before. We were making for Belluno, because from there we would make a second day's journey to see the Alpini. Belluno was a good convenient spot to make a start from, for the last lap of the business, and moreover contained a lot of military headquarter officials with power to give permission for various visits. We scaled a crowd of mountains in that car and crashed along through many a lonely forest glade. The water in the radiator started to boil in the middle of one mountainous forest, and we had to explain radiators and their need for water to two aboriginal girls who were living in a woodcutter's hut hard by. They fetched us some water and were suitably rewarded by the Duke. The same evening we started our spiral descent down towards Belluno, which lies in a valley in the mountains. About six o'clock we crossed the bridge into the town and glided up to the courtyard of an hotel, just off the main square. So ended the first stage of the journey. End of chapter 29. Recording by Philip Gould.